can hear you perfect. Yes, I can you hear look, you well. And you yes. look beautiful. Okay. Guys, we Thank are live. You. Thank My you God. so much for your little Wonderful. technical difficulties. So it happens. It happens. <laughs> Dr. Farouk Albaz, dearest yes. friend who I miss terribly from our days back in Boston. Thank you so much for being our guest. Um, I did a little bio about you, but in case readers don't know, one of the first people to work at NASA, you're a geologist extraordinaire. I was terrified of you in college because I knew how important <laughs> you were, but the reality being you're like the nicest man in the world that I've ever met. So I'm gushing right now. This is obvious. Well, when, but, the, when do you were the, the, good, the best uh, geologist in the whole bunch of them? And you were well, uh, you know, you, my professors may disagree of, with you. Sure. And, and you <laughs> Don't get her ego the, going. The, and, the head of the, and the head of the geology group of students, and she was really fabulous. I, I love her. I, I really was. I consider her one of our very best students, no question. Oh, well, well, you, you can tell us the truth when we're not live. That's the exactly. Yes. <laughs> Don't tell people the real story. But um, so D Farouk Albaz, um, obviously NASA, obviously JPL, moon lunar landings, Mars missions, worked on those. All of that is extremely important. And I know that our listeners probably are gushing to hear about that. Um, what I, what, oh, I forgot something horrible. I, I forgot to introduce my co-hosts. So Miss Joy Langford, our environmental consultant. Everybody knows me. <laughs> And Hi. Mr. Joel Lundet, who is also a Boston University graduate and is oh, our really? in-house realtor. And former NASA worked... employee. I used to work at headquarters. Wow. Yes. So I'm surprised y'all didn't hit, run into each other in the hallways. Um, but one of the things with environmental social justice, we're talking about, you know, environment, climate change, sustainability, the new buzzword on everyone's lips, ESG. But most importantly, your work in remote sensing. So remote sensing is satellite imagery. For people who don't know what that means, you, you look at satellite imagery, so images from space, and then you can see beneath sand to find water. You can look beneath sand and see geological structures, geomorphology. So one of the things Farouk wanted to talk about today was using satellite imagery for social impact. And I'm assuming that would mean um, sea level change, prone to floods, storm surges, fire, heat, you know, all of these things that are impacting us as a society, especially in the Middle East, which is a lot of your work is done in that area, the heat index is unbelievably high. I mean, entire um, civilizations are in jeopardy right now. So if you wanted to talk about your research in that, I will let you have the floor and I will shut up. <laughs> Not at all. I've never seen you shut up. <laughs> Nor have we. <laughs> <laughs> and, no comment. And, and I don't want you to shut up. I want you to keep me no on some time. Yes. <laughs> oh, the idea is really uh, the fact that satellite images were a fabulous thing to get to uh, starting with 1972, right after the Apollo program. Because we realized that without good images, we could not have actually done the Apollo missions to the moon and made absolutely certain that the astronauts would be safe they would not crash into some hill somewhere, or they would not sink into a hole anyway. So there was really a, a recognition of the fact that satellite images of the moon, prior to even thinking about where the astronauts would land, were essential to that program. If we did not have good pictures, we would not have been had the guts to say, yes, the astronaut can land here. And land here by whom? By the... the uh, group that actually selected the landing site on the moon. And I was the secretary of that group. Yeah, it was a secretary of the Lunar Landing Site Selection Committee. And we would fight with each other. We cannot do suggest that place if we don't know for certain that we could do that would be safe. I mean, would you land in that spot yourself or not? If not, you cannot, then the hello it, we cannot talk about that, that possibility of a landing site here. So it was really a, a, a recognition of the fact that images from above are certainly fabulous. We can see everything on the ground and we can interpret what made that thing that we see on the ground. Because the moon was very different from the earth and we had to look at the, at the moon and say, okay, what was the geologic history of this place? Having, yes. never, never, having never been there, having never had samples, having never seen a goddamn thing about it. No, having, when you, having no I, topographic maps, having nothing. And you can ask that question because it is essential for selection of landing sites. 
Go ahead, Wendy. Did you run into any issues with the actual landings? Like you had everything planned, you had everything calculated, you had everything you thought was perfect. And then when reality hit, did anything happen during the landing sites where you're like, oh crap, this was no. wrong? No, the no. crap was only missing missing the exact point that we we had selected before because of some goddamn engineering problem or another. For instance, Apollo 11, that was the first one, Apollo 11 landed four kilometers w uh, west of what it's supposed to do. And we, we actually didn't know where in the hell they landed. And for a while, we didn't know, and we didn't know exact spot of landing until they left the moon and they were on, on the way to the Earth. And it was a disaster for us as far as geolog geological knowledge was concerned because the, the place that we selected for them, the exact spot, did not they did not land on it why because there was an a an extra push from when the spacecraft was locked up to the uh, to the other piece that stays in orbit there was an extra push for for, for it and that actually did not did, 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 thought that it's uh, it's here but actually it was four kilometers beyond so it oh. was a, a and during the separation there was an extra energy that pushed it out further away from what it's supposed to go. So it was not a, a, a problem for the astronauts themselves or for the director yeah. of the site, but it's the engineering. When when they separated, they, they sep the two spacecraft separated with an extra push, an extra velocity that landed it four kilometers west of the place. But uh, otherwise, everything everything went beyond that. We uh, Apollo 12, because of Apollo 11's misery, of what they landed and we didn't know where and they didn't they couldn't tell us and we couldn't tell the engineers where they landed and they would look at us and and the, the head of the astronaut office when he would come to me and he say where the hell they landed for Rook? i tell him we're still working on it say, god damn it <laughs> no stress <laughs> disgusted they leave disgusted and that because of that the apollo 12 uh, mission the main objective of the apollo mission the apollo 12 was pinpoint landing that was the, 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 the most important thing to do, is to land on the point because of the yeah. mystery of Apollo 12. And that was, we, we, fixed, we, we fixed that. We had a, a, a tiny little crater they could actually see from orbit and the tiny little crater that we could see everywhere and that they would, they would be able to see it and land next to it and no matter what the hell happened. And they did. Oh, perfect! So, what oh, type of what type of what type of terrain are you looking for? Just in a in a roundabout, you know, non scientific way. What type of terrain are you looking for? What type of atmosphere are you looking for? Like from one place to another to kind of let you know that this is a solid place to land. Oh, uh, uh, we're looking at craters because craters would unleash some big blocks of rock. And we want because we wanted to land in absolutely flat terrain, and we had to figure out how do you how do you figure out what flat. We had had no topographic maps, we had no GPSs, nothing like that. So we have absolutely flat terrain because the spacecraft could not actually land on a on a surface that is more than twelve degrees in tilt. Twelve degrees is very little. So if it is if it's twelve degrees in tilt, the spacecraft will topple over. So that was a huge thing. So how do we measure topography and tilt on the moon? We had no topographic maps. So we no thought, clue. okay, we will do photometry. So we'll see if the sun is straight out, on, looking straight down at you, it, yeah. it will be absolutely white and you cannot see a thing if the sun is right in your eye. And if the sun is completely out of your sight, it will be in the dark. And anywhere between this very bright and black, are shades of gray. So let us measure the shades of gray in each and every lunar orbiter picture that we have. So we had photometry, measuring the photos per, uh, per, per site in, in the satellite images before we actually figured that, yes, this plate is flat enough. It's only less than five degrees of tilt or whatever. Yeah, because, because we know from the zero and that the other 180. So it was actually a very interesting way of doing things. Oh, the best yeah. one. Number two is blocks, big chunk of rock. And we thought, okay, how, how do we find get big blocks of rock on the moon? Why would, why would the moon have big blocks? 
So we exactly. said that ejecta, ejecta from, from meteorites. Okay, let's look at meteorites and meteorite impacts in the earth and see how blocks are uh, uh, de uh, deployed around the impact craters. How the large blocks, are they near the rim of the crater or farther away from the crater? So we found out that actually, like Meteor Crater in Arizona, some of you might know it. Meteor Crater, have you ever heard of it? It's a big... No. Meteor, yeah, okay, a real, honest to God, big meteorite crater south of Flagstaff, Arizona, and beautiful meteorite okay. impact crater, yeah. Uh, if you go to Arizona, it may pass by there because it is a beautiful, the, the best example of a meteorite crater. Everything is still intact. Some guy would just admit that his PhD on it, so we knew a great deal about. And that in that place, you can see very large blocks near the rim of the crater and smaller blocks away, from blocks away. From, it makes sense that if the meteorite cut an impact, boom, like this, the stuff that will break right next to it will be the larger one. So we said, okay. So we on the moon, we look at impact craters and we get away from the rims. <laughs> Even if we want to study the crater, get the hell out of there. First, land, and then you can walk there. And we did that for, <laughs> and then we did that for Apollo uh, 12, and they did walk up there. And they actually missed the rim of the crater, but they walked up there and got a, some of the a big chunks of, of rock there. So it was like that. So it, there was really no other way of doing it except that. Because we had just pictures of a place we, don't, we have never seen, and we don't know anything about it, and we have no topographic maps of it. And this is it. This is what, this is what you have. So you have to make do with what you have. That and the, when the astronauts went up, they didn't know if they were coming back. I got That's to true. meet, yeah, That's I got to meet because... Annie Glenn, John Glenn's wife at an event, and everyone was all over John Glenn. And I'm yes. like, I'm gonna talk to the wife because she's cool. And she told me, she's like, we didn't know if they were coming back. That is right, because there was really no assurance of the fact that it is going to work out right, or the damn things will link to, to each other, or the thing would, would land straight up and stay straight up because it could have toppled over and that would be the end of them. And because uh, if, if, if the land where they landed was more than 13 degrees, they would topple over. That, yeah. that would be end of it. Yeah. And you can't exactly put it, you know, throw it back up again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Nobody can throw it up again. That's right. <laughs> so, so there were all kinds of, of uh, misgivings and all kinds of question, questionable things. And uh, thank God everything worked out all right. And we proved that satellite images can prepare you for whatever. You can look at them and look at them well. And if you are intelligent enough, you can garner all kinds of information from above, from pictures taken from above. And, and that's, that's what, what I love. That's what I love about you starting the Center of Remote Sensing at Boston University. That is right. You you dove into that. Like you created lenses and that is right. that, you you did it. I mean, I can't even go into how many things you've done. It's remarkable. But I love the fact we're now looking back towards the Earth. Yeah. And the tree morphology and what do you see is like with climate change specifically, because you know, that's kind of our focus. How is that affecting communities with floods, storms, surges, heat? You know, where do you see the most dire situations, I suppose? Or what do you what are you doing your research on currently? Okay, well, with the climate, I'm doing more more of my research, as you remember, from the on the water in the desert. And that's yeah. still a very significant aspect. And it is every, people worldwide, like just think of people living only in the California desert and in Arizona desert, and they have no other mountains and it never snows there and it never rains there and so on. How in the hell would they get water in these places in Arizona and, and California if they are away from uh, mountains and rain? So yeah. it becomes a very essential thing for life. And uh, so and what we did was, of just asking essential questions like that when you go into the desert and see these vast numbers of, of, of sand. Actually, I wondered once uh, about the, 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 the uh, origin of sand. And I said, wait a minute, okay, what, what, this huge amount of sand worldwide in desert areas. How in the hell did, the, how did this sand form? What? Yeah. Where did the sand come from? Just this simple question. That apparently was never asked in geology. And they said, what the, these vast amounts of sand in the, in the Sahara of North Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, enormous amounts. What, what brought that sand here? How, do, how was the sand grain for? Because we know that. Paleo ocean? <laughs> A paleo ocean? I'm just guessing here. Well, <laughs> what ocean? The ocean makes sand. The sand is made of 
uh, silicon dioxide. So it is a metal with oxygen. When under the ocean, there is no such thing. No. No. So this is SiO2, silicon dioxide. So this is something that, that, that is formed from silicon. There's no big, no small potato. That's silicon oxide. Where is silicon oxide? Well, in, in acidic rocks. What are acidic rocks? Granite. Okay. So what, what are the compositions of granite? This and this and this and that and quartz. What's made of quartz? SiO2. Ah. So if quartz is SiO2, the quartz that you, you probably have some jewelry made of quartz. Well, Not currently you might. On. Oh, I have some okay. feldspar on. <laughs> what might, might, it might be it made, of, made of quartz. That mineral, quartz, is kind of clear and nice and b b colorful and so on. Sometimes it is amethystic. Amethyst is purple and this and that, but mostly white. And it is made of basically SiO2, meaning uh, uh, silicon dioxide only. And that is exactly the, the composition of sand. So, okay. So, sand comes from granite. How the hell is, does that happen? Erosion. Granite, granite, yeah, erosion. So, how does erosion do it? Erosion where? It rains. Rocks are broken up from the mountain. They hit each other. They cut, tuck, 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 tuck. Coming down hill, they hit from each other. And they, they break into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And the pieces are rolled in the river. Uh, channels and the bottom of the river, all of this motion, rock after other, and actually it turns out that these kind of rotate on each other like this, rounding them as they move in the bottom of the rivers. So the, the motion of this particular material, again, rubbing against each other is what rounds it out. So the rounding of the grains happens during and I didn't know, I didn't learn that in, in college. I learned that in the desert, looking at it and say, what that makes? You look at the sand grain and say, what the hell is that? And you look at sand grains that are beautifully round and quartz and so on, and then you say their color is red, their color is yellowish, and then their color is red. So they, I, they actually, the color is yellow, or the color is red, is something that happens to these sand grains after they are exposed to nature later in the desert mm. but oh. during the ah during the formation it is all pure white from the quartz clear either clear completely clear like crystal or white that's quartz so you have all of these round grains that go keep on going and then they keep going and they keep going with all the way until they cover nearly all the coastlines of all continents from the rainfall that hits in mountains in the middle of the continents. You find this sand as the product of the, all of this erosion and, and continue rubbing against each other and rounding of the grains until they reach the sea. And the sea waves can kind of spread them around the ocean. So this is how sand comes in. <laughs> and then, if you are in the, <coughs> in the desert, then there will be motion in because in on the uh, on the beaches the motion is wet so they actually stay the same some of them once in a while would cover would be covered with a thin a thin layer of salt by the evaporation water and salt from the sea comes in there and some of some of the sand looks whitish because it has a very thin cover of uh, of salt that's all around the beaches of the whole world this way yeah. If you are in the desert, away from the ocean, just broken up around the beautiful grains and so on, go, go into the into the sea, then to the desert, onto the land, and then they are exposed to other particulate material that is clay, meaning dust, and yeah. iron oxide, and this and that, and all of these things that accumulate on top, because the, the actually the quartz grain is a, a negative, a negatively charged because it's SiO two. And these things can, right, because they are positively charged, they can stick to them. But kaolinite and other minerals, meaning meaning Popular. dust, dust yeah. or 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 uh, uh, or iron oxide, uh, is stuck to them on the outside for a few microns thickness. And we are measured up to eight microns thickness. So if if they are grayish or dull yellow, it's covered with uh, with uh, clay. And it, if, if it is reddish, that you see all kinds of sand dunes that are red, magnificent red. And this is because each and every sand grain is covered with a little bit of 
of uh, of uh, mm -hmm. iron oxide. Oh, now, wow. so okay, these are for the sand. Now, so the sand comes in from water, meaning rain. So the was rain. It had rain somewhere, most likely in the mountain. Okay, go to take the picture of the mountain. From the mountain picture, you see the channels that actually led the sand downhill and then dumped the sand somewhere and they discovered well, you don't know the somewhere so but you assume that yes these channels came here and went that away what were what how did these channels were formed with water okay the water came in here could there have been a rock that is porous to take some of that water and suck it in and therefore it will still be inside and that's how you look for groundwater you know, potential. You can say, okay, that little river followed that away, and this way it's all igneous rocks and that, that, so there ain't gonna be nothing. But this mm -hmm. rock has limestone or sandstone and this and that, and the limestone has porosity and sandstone has more porosity. So if it's limestone, there will be little water. If it's sandstone, potentially a lot more water in sandstone layers because there is porosity and the water will go into between the pores of these rocks. So the water underground is not in a in a nice looking layer of water. No, it is actually water in tiny little spaces be between the grains. So it is it is just a, a, the voids, and the water would be in the voids between the round grains of sand. So if you can, if you think of round grains here and around three like that, there will be a void in between them, and that yeah. water would there be. So you only sink a hole in the in that rock, the water will accumulate in that, and then you just pump it out because the water would like to go to any space that's lower than where it is. <laughs> Let's use so work with that. Water would like to go into any space that's lower where than it is. That's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things. So um, I know you did a lot of work in defer, yeah. finding trying to find water, and that was a yeah. that was a big program that you initiated. Yes. I think in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going on. Um, had they been able to get enough water? You know, oh, I know a lot, a whole bunch. Actually, there is a, a, town, a town now built in the in around the wells of the of the uh, of the place where it's adjusted to them. There are several wells, not just one, many, actually. And uh, it must be over 20 wells now. Over. Uh, places because I left all the maps with the governor so that the pe people themselves would know. And and the governor had all the heads of the towns with them. I, when I met with him, when I could go to meet with him, he brought everybody, all the heads of everybody around. So I would be sitting down with 60, 50, 50, 60 people discussing to, with them this, showing slides and showing them the places and then leaving the maps for them. So oh, they did. Great. They had the maps with them and they knew exactly what I was talking about. I explained it fully, showed them the pictures, showed them the pictures of uh, places like that, which we did in Egypt, to them to prove that we did that in Egypt. And yeah. then they took, they took the ideas and, and, and drilled and found out, that, and they would write to me back and say, why, God, you were right, we have found this such and such, you were great, yeah. So we did I, that them, with them, yeah. I remember one of the first satellite images you showed me in your office back when I was a student was the desert. And there was this perfect line of yes. green agriculture and sand. Yeah. And you said, I want to do over here what they did over there. We need that's to bring right. agriculture. And that's what you've done. I mean, it takes some time, and I'm sure there are politics involved, that of is, course, yeah, which makes that challenging. Yeah. Um, what would you like to see people do next with this technology? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a valuable resource that I don't think is used enough. Not, no, it's not used enough at all, because I really think that we, including you, uh, the geologists have not been forthcoming enough with explaining all of this to the, the uh, people, public, publicly to everybody and his mother. So meaning meaning the state uh, managers of, of, of electricity in the state, managers of water in HST, all of these people should know that. They are mostly lawyers and, and uh, uh, engineers. Yeah, yeah. Most, uh, layers and engineers and so on that would have no idea what the hell would you mean satellite images when I, uh, I can I can perceive that this would be good enough for my work in here right uh, do you know what voltage is uh, you don't know that so so we, and, you know, so we have not been 
uh, thoughtful enough to go and say, sit with them and tell them that you are fabulous in your work and this and that, and here is something that we can actually help. But, and we explain it in, in language that, that they could understand. And we have not been forthcoming this way. So geologists are people that have not been able to convey to the world at large all of this notion about what the, what the nature of, that, of the things that we see outside mean. What, why do we see grass here? Or why do we have this little hole? And why should we such and such? And if you want to do this and that there, you should look at this and this, and, and we will help. We have not done that. It, yeah, we geologists matter. We're important people. Yeah. <laughs> We're but often you but you, you are. Proven that. You haven't proven that. We have not proven that to the no, lay to the lay person or the guy that writes a newspaper article. He, he doesn't know. And if we sit with him and use goddamn technical knowledge or the, 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 the Latin names for uh, minerals and rocks, then he said, "Well, God damn it, yeah, we'll go home." Well, I have I have one last like offbeat question. Sure. If we are able to do space travel with Tesla and some of these other organizations that are trying, would you personally get on one of those? Oh, absolutely. Like, oh, absolutely. You would. The whole, the whole universe is fantastic. There are all kinds of things. Mars is, is is just an incredible planet with all kinds of things. Because, for instance, Mars was very much like the Earth. It had an ocean, it has water, it had all kinds of things, very much like the volcanoes and this and this and that, and has valleys that that exist here. And, and then there were none. So there was the water, all the water escaped, the leftover water iced under the, the, the surface, and uh, the, uh, the oxygen and uh, escaped, all of oxygen escaped the planet, and we don't know how. That's why we have a mission to Mars right now to study the upper atmosphere of Mars and how oxygen is lost from the atmosphere because we have no idea how in the hell would all of that oxygen has had left the planet's atmosphere. So there are all kinds of fascinating things in the, in, and that is the universe around us. So what, what about the universe way beyond, which is really, which must have been, must have also fascinating things. So of course, if there is a chance to go anywhere and look from way out there, <laughs> there I would love to. <laughs> I'll book my ticket with you. Yeah, absolutely. You can be the tour guide. Yeah, good. <laughs> and he knows what he's I talking would. about when he gets right. there. <laughs> but Joel, you said that um, three other countries, I think, were planning on landing on Mars pretty soon. Not landing. Going, no? to, the, uh, going to the upper atmosphere of Mars. And this oh. spacecraft, uh, spacecraft called Amel. I'm a member of the advisory council of that amount, and it has reached the, uh, the uh, their destination two days ago. Oh, fantastic. Uh, read, read in the New York Times today. And I bet the Los Angeles Times has something about it. Oh, that's, that's fabulous. Called, it's called the UAE space mission. I'll check that out now. Yeah. I just have to ask, has Elon Musk ever reached out to you because nobody knows more about this stuff than you? No, but that's all right. I mean, he's he's working on the big machines and so on to take uh, whole, whole, uh, uh, stacks of people or a big uh, something or a hotel even to the space. So I'm not in that league. I'm in the league uh, of looking, looking down and uh, little things. Yeah, I'm not in the league of the of the engineers. The engineers, the engineers should come first. Yeah, it's after sure. they go there and not know what to do, then they will come to me. Yeah. There you go. Because I just land and they'll be now what? <laughs> so um joel any final questions joy any final questions i will let you guys close out now, are you going to come back yeah. <laughs> sure i will see you in la yes, I, think so yes. Now. I was telling on. joy about the last yeah. time um, i saw you one of the last times i saw you was when i picked you up at jpl and you were surrounded by students and yes. <laughs> i was just like can you should I leave you? And they're like, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. And I like, picked you up and we went out to dinner. But I just remember pulling up and just horrid, like you were you were being fangirled or fanboyed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, this has been That's a awesome. treat for me because I do miss you terribly. Please, you know, my you, abilities man. to travel right now are limited. But if you ever make yeah. it out to LA, please, please, please call on us. And thank you for your time. I thank know you. that you are incredibly busy and Please work on those memoirs. There's so much history that you have. Thank you, my dear. 
read that book. And thank you. I will let you guys say goodbye and thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Take care. Bye.